Together, what if we were able to run the race of life better because we're doing it with each other? What if we were able to run the race of life better? Well, today we're going to talk about that, but it's probably not going to be the kind of race that you're thinking about. The scripture that we're going to be reading will talk about race, and it also talks about this great cloud of witnesses and the faith of the people that have gone before us. So let's begin by reading Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. And by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn into two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins and of sheep and goats, destituted, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. About 10 years ago, I allowed some friends of mine to talk me into running in a Marine Corps mud run. Now, folks, I enjoy the outdoors. I like hiking, even backpacking, but I am in no way, shape, or form a runner. In fact, I would bet the last time I ran anything that even resembled a race was back in ninth grade gym when you had to run the mile. So to say I entered into this mud run cold turkey is an understatement. But I was feeling young and confident. So me and my friends, we sign up and we run this race. Let me tell you guys, this was no presidential fitness test. We were crawling under barbed wire, jumping over obstacles. At any point along the way, Marines could make you drop and do push-ups or sit-ups. They were throwing buckets of mud in our face. Needless to say, halfway through this thing, I was wondering what in the world I got myself into. My shins were busted up. At one point, a lady used my face as a step as we were trying to climb up this mud-covered vertical hill. The entire thing was absolutely insane. So I'm covered in mud, I'm beat up, and we're rounding the corner for the, the very last obstacle. It's the largest mud pit I've ever seen step into it and I immediately lose my footing. At some points I'm barely keeping my head above the water and I make it out to the other side and I stop. You see we all stopped. We stopped because the way you finished this particular race was by crossing the finish line as a team. We would have been disqualified if we did not finish this race together. In our passage today, the writer of Hebrews is describing the life of faith much like the mud run I just described. He's drawing on the imagery of the Roman marathon that would have started far outside the city. And the runners would have put their bodies to the test as they ran the distance. There would be moments of pain and suffering, thirst and hunger, falling down and getting back up. But as they get closer to the city, they begin to hear the roar of the crowd. People who have gathered in the Colosseum to watch them finish. Who have gathered to cheer them on, to celebrate with them. The New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson identifies the entire theme, the whole arc of the book of Hebrews as one of sojourning. Viewing this life as a journey, a journey to a better place. And also a journey that is shaped by that better place. The life of faith for the writer of Hebrews means living in the here and now in a way that is shaped by that 
destination, that something better in the future. It's a life that perhaps looks different than those around us because we're not living for present recognition or present rewards, but for a future one. The life of faith aims to model itself off of how Jesus lived. The life of faith promises us something better. However, at times, the life of faith can be difficult. And the writer of Hebrews seems to be recognizing that and even responding to it in our passage. We read in chapter 10 that the Christian community has suffered and perhaps maybe they're considering quitting the race. In verse 32, it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. The message in our passage is clear. Keep running the race. Keep living the life of faith. Keep going. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, describes the life of faith a little differently. He calls it the process of sanctification. Instead of a finish line at the end of the race, we are aiming to be perfected in love in this life by the grace of God. This life of faith is a, a process of being transformed and filled by God and being shaped by that unseen future reality in the here and now. In fact, one of the questions that Wesley asked, in our, and we still ask it today in our ordination ceremonies, was this, are you going on to perfection? In other words, are you living this life of faith? Are you still running in the race? Wesley, perhaps, would think of this race as what he called spiritual respiration. He claimed in this life of faith, God is breathing into the soul. And the soul is breathing back what it first receives from God. A continual action of God upon the soul and a reaction of the soul upon God. There is an absolute necessity of this reaction of the soul. For it plainly appears, Wesley says, that God does not continue to act upon the soul unless the soul reacts upon God. You see, there are times along the way where we can stop reacting to the grace and the love of God. We can neglect our neighbors. We can neglect time with God. We can put ourselves before others. We can never make time to stop and live the life that Jesus modeled for us. There are moments along this race where we stop, where we sit out, where we throw in the towel. There are obstacles and temptations that take our focus off the race and cause our souls to stop reacting to God. The writer of Hebrews encourages his readers to focus, to lay aside the weights that slow us down, to, to get rid of the sin that clings to us and, and grinds us to a halt. And to look to Jesus. When I think about that mud run all these years later, one thing that really sticks with me is the ending. Now, I knew ahead of time that we had to finish together. And because of this, it caused me to pay attention to where my friends were along the way. It caused me to concern, be concerned about whether or not they were okay. In fact, it didn't matter how fast I ran or how fast they ran. If I was going to finish, it had to be with them by my side. I later learned that this run is modeled after the Marine Corps motto, until they are home, no man left behind. This is what the life of faith is like. For almost the entire 11th chapter, the writer of Hebrews is name-dropping all of these heroes of the faith who lived out the life of faith that the author is suggesting. They have ran the race. Heroes like Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, and Moses, David, and Samson. But they have all ran this race. 
But in verse 39, it tells us that even though they've ran the race, they haven't yet finished the race. Verse 39 says, Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. God has something better than finishing the race? God has something to be in first? I mean, what's the point of being the fastest runner? What's, what's the point of conditioning? What's the point of, of running this race if winning isn't the point? You see, the something better that God has is that we finish the race together. But the way the writer of Hebrews frames this can be difficult to swallow. I mean, some of the names that he drops as runners in the race, they, they don't sometimes compute with the way we think about the life of faith. I mean, I took it personal when he talked about the walls of Jericho, and he didn't mention my namesake, Joshua. No, instead, it's Rahab, the prostitute, the foreigner, the, the, the lady who belonged to the group of the people who were supposed to be destroyed by the Israelites. You mean to tell me she ran the race too? She lived a life of faith? And what about Jephthah? You remember Jephthah, right? He comes back from a great victory and he makes a vow to God that he'll sacrifice whatever comes out of the front door of his house. And it's his daughter. I mean, we have all lost sleep trying to think about Jephthah. How in the world has he ran the race? I mean, how is he marked as those who have lived the life of faith? When we try to determine who can run the race, we get in God's way. Because God has provided something better. What is that something better? It's Jesus. And in Jesus, all are welcome to run the race. All are welcome to live the life of faith. We don't get decide, to decide for Jesus. We are simply called to run the race. And so instead of looking around and, and trying to determine who's in and who's out and who we feel comfortable running alongside of, we simply need to look to Jesus. That's it. Period. Look to Jesus. Live like Jesus. Love like Jesus. Accept like Jesus. Include like Jesus. You may be watching this today and say, look, I see what's going on in the church. I see what's going on with all of these Christians. And you're not even looking to touch the church with a 10-foot pole. I get it. I understand. We, we have failed so often, but I, I implore you to, to get the message that the writer of Hebrews is saying and that message is that God has something better. And that something better, it involves me and you and them and those that are not even yet with us. You see, the imagery that this ends with is as they enter the Colosseum, there's this roar of the crowd, this great cloud of witnesses, as the writer calls them. Heroes of the faith, those who have ran the race, those that are going to run the race, and they're waiting on you, and they're waiting on me. They're waiting on countless souls to finish the race. And so don't allow the judgments of people, the judgments of Christian and, 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 the, and the faults of the church to deter you from living this life of faith. Because God has something better for you. That something better is Jesus. And Jesus is calling to all of us to run this race. And so I invite you to run this race for Jesus. I invite you to look around you. Look at people that perhaps you've been told, nah, you can't run with them. Perhaps God is telling you, no, that's exactly who I want you to lock arms with and finish this race with. Decide who that is and run the race together. Don't allow the divisions of this world, the schisms of this world, the failures of the church and the failures of other Christians to keep you from living into that something better, that perfection and love, that being with Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. All throughout my history, faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storm made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see.
promises of fulfillment all over my When we know that God is writing our story, we can see Him in every episode and on every page. My prayer for us is that we would be people who display the evidence of God's goodness in all we do. I'm grateful you gave this time to watch today and for this online ministry opportunity and the giving and resources that make it possible. If you would like to support Together What If, you can go to gfumc.com give. And as always, you can help us build online bridges to Christ by liking and sharing this content. This week, may we have eyes to see how God is working and creating something better for us and for the world. And may we be intentional in helping others cross the finish line of faith with us. See you next Sunday.